Okay, everybody, we're ready to start our Committee of the Whole session. We have five items this afternoon. The first is a presentation from Attorney Brian Beggs regarding the efforts of the City of Spokane and Spokane County to update and reform their criminal justice system. And I'm going to ask Councilmember Hamill, please, to introduce this. Thank you. Um, Mr. Beggs will provide background on Spokane's jail proposal alternatives diversion services and how they are working with diverse perspectives on solutions in criminal justice reform. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Mr. Beggs. Um, Brian graduated from Whitworth University uh, and the University of Washington School of Law with the highest of honors. He managed the largest private law firm in Bellingham and served as an executive director at the Center for Justice in Spokane for six years. In 2011, the Washington Supreme Court chose him to be on its Access to Justice Board, where he works to make the legal system work for those who don't have the resources to hire their own lawyers. He currently practices law with a private firm. Last December 2nd, I traveled to Spokane to learn more about their community's opportunities, challenges, and progress in changing and reforming their criminal justice system. Brian was essential in ensuring that I, that I had access to judges, prosecutors, public defenders, citizen advocates, and other stakeholders. So in addition to reporting my observations and findings to this body and to the uh, broader community, I felt that you would all be better served in hearing directly from Brian. Thank you for coming, Brian, and welcome. Okay, perfect, thank you. I know a couple of you council members from before. My time in Bellingham, I left in 2004, and um, my wife and I had our three kids here, and they're still still thriving, and we have great, great memories and great hopes for you. Um, I spoke earlier today at the Jail Alternatives Task Force, and I'm not going to repeat everything, one, because they gave me more time to do it, and I also just want to focus in a little more on um, the city, because uh, in Spokane, we have a very similar dynamic. We have a municipal court, um, and we have a county that tends to be uh, more rural and more conservative. Uh, we have all the elected departments over at the county, whereas uh, at the city you're a little more unified uh, on things. And as I've described it to people over the years, uh, we have an urban justice problem and a rural justice problem, and sometimes they take different solutions. Uh, but because of the way government is structured in Washington, you share the same uh, jail, as I'm sure you well aware. And I, just so you know, I, uh, I follow in the Herald uh, online um, uh, all the things that are going on. So I have some, some knowledge of, of what you guys have been going through. Um, I am partly coming here on behalf of a community organization in Spokane called Spokane Smart Justice. And just to give you context, about four years ago, um, they were going to propose a big vote on a $200 million jail that they were going to build way out in the county. And uh, many of us organized against that. We thought that was bad policy. And we won that argument without even going to the ballot um, because Spokane is known as even more parsimonious or parsimonious than uh, Bellingham on taxes. And so there was no way they were going to build a $200 million jail. But a lot of us said, you know, the economy will uh, grow again and we need to have some alternatives in place so that there's not gonna be pressure to do it again. Um, and so a group of us, small group formed, and then we got bigger, and we have 30 organizations, uh, faith groups, community organizations, and we came up with this uh, phrase, smart justice. And we are asking government to, whenever they make a criminal justice decision, uh, make that decision through the lens of smart justice. And the way we define that is, uh, does it reduce crime? Uh, does it save money for taxpayers, and does it transform lives? Uh, and put all the sort of rhetoric and faith-based platitudes uh, away and just focus on the evidence. And that was our message, and we conveyed it to government and actually gotten some good traction from the city and county. And uh, a couple years ago, they started a Law and Justice Council that consists of lots of electeds from the city and county, and then there's eight subcommittees that are working on specific things like what type of facility do we need, what technology do we need, uh, what kind of alternatives are effective, um, how can uh, governments work together across boundaries and jurisdictions. That's been going on for two years, and I'm happy to report, this, despite the same kinds of tensions that have been in this community, uh, we've gotten mostly over those and we're, we're moving ahead. And so I want to share 
just a few uh, of some of the ideas that are actually working or soon to be working. And then I wanted to um, tell you just my ideas for whatever they're worth about ways the city can proceed with or without the county's cooperation on things that are within your purview. Um, but the, the first, before I do that, philosophically, I wanna make one point and I made it earlier today. And that is that uh, a very high paid jail consultant um, came to Spokane and left us with this one piece of wisdom that I think is really important. And what he said um, was, uh, the size of your jail is not related to how big your community is or what your crime rate. It's related to what your policy on how you use the jail. So if, if your policy, we just wanna lock up everyone that's uh, allegedly committed a crime, then you need a very big jail. If you wanna lock up people who um, are dangerous and likely to commit a crime if they're not restrained, then it doesn't have to be as big. And so for the last few years in Spokane, and I would encourage you in Bellingham, is to figure out who you want in the jail and, and, and why. And in Spokane, I think similarly to Bellingham, uh, only 18% of the people in the county jail are there actually serving a sentence because a judge said that's what they needed to do. Uh, the rest of them are waiting for some type of hearing, including about half of the people have not even been convicted yet, it's, but they're not very reliable about showing up for court and they don't have enough money to post bail. So they're not really necessarily considered even guilty yet. Um, according to our jail commander, half of them are not uh, dangerous as far as violence. And yet we're spending $130 a day keeping them in jail and causing further damage. They've lost their job, their housing, they're not parenting. And so there's all these collateral damages. Um, and so what we're trying to imagine is how do we get people to court uh, who are not dangerous without spending $130 a day in jail, essentially. Uh, and then, so that, that's the low hanging fruit. And the higher hanging fruit is what can we do when we have them under the control of our criminal justice system to address what we call criminogenic needs of why they're committing crimes so that they're unlikely to reoffend. And so we're, the great news in Spokane is we're, we're doing that. We've sort of gotten out of the, we just have to punish all criminals and they've sinned against society and they're being voted off the island um, because the truth is no one's ever really voted off the island. They all come back to our neighborhoods. And so uh, it, hopefully they'll be better off when they come there. Um, so that's, that's what's going on there. We're, um, uh, I would say the top thing that we're doing from a policy standpoint is we're developing a risk needs assessment tool that pretrial services can use with people who come into the system and assess how dangerous are they, what are their triggers, what are their needs, is it a housing issue, is it a substance abuse, is it mental health? And through all of that, there's always personal accountability. And so none of what I'm talking about is to take anything away from people's personal accountability to follow the rules and be productive. But for those people who aren't, if there are factors that are contributing to it, we need to identify whether they should stay in uh, jail, whether they should be released um, under some type of supervision, whether they should be in some kind of treatment or monitoring. Uh, and so, that's what, so that first step is a, a good assessment. And there is a good one out there that's proven called the strong R assessment. And Spokane is customizing it right now so that we can use it for a municipal court and uh, district court system. Once you have that, your judges and your prosecutors then have the tools they need to decide what should happen with people. Uh, and we are uh, planning on adding our pretrial services staff so that there's more people to do those assessments early and then they can be released to electronic home monitoring. Electronic home monitoring is very promising because it costs about eight to $12 a day in, Bel in Spokane as opposed to $130 a day at the jail. And they're monitored you know, 24 seven. Uh, there's a sensor that detects whether they're using alcohol if that's an issue. They can be drug tested if that's an issue. And you basically punch in the GPS coordinates of where they can be, where their job is, if they have a job, where their kids daycare is. And if they go outside of that, red lights go off somewhere and you, a law enforcement person can go, can go get them. Um, the, the beauty of it is instead of holding several hundred people on the off chance that a couple of them might not follow that, uh, you have all these people out there and then if one or two people breaks out of what they're supposed to be doing, you can quickly address it. So it's way cheaper as, you know, eight to $12, $130. And one of the keys in reform is that you have cost accounting so that when you get those savings, you actually keep that in the system. 
uh, so that you have that law enforcement person on duty all time, so that you can uh, pay for some of the things that will help people get reformed, like housing and employment. Um, so electronic home monitoring, we estimate that it could probably get several hundred people out of our jail um, in, in Spokane. And that's, I'm saying writ large Spokane, not just the city of Spokane. Our city is actually uh, on a pilot project. They hired two probation officers just to do electronic home monitoring. So they are already doing that uh, and they hope to expand that. Um, I'll mention just briefly, we talked about a portability, excuse me, a diversion facility. I know that's kind of on the, on, on the lookout. It's a mental health facility uh, that officers can take someone to instead of jail. And the beauty of it is if it meets Medicaid criteria of 16 beds or less and the person has a diagnosis and they're low income, which most people are in that system, the federal government pays for the stay instead of the government paying for it at the jail. Um, one of the things that's particularly um, helpful in a city situation is uh, something we call a portability judge. Right now in Spokane, I'm sure it's similar here, someone gets picked up uh, arrested and they get charged with a felony and they get charged with a misdemeanor and they get appointed a city public defender and there's a city prosecutor and a city judge and they've got a superior court and you're, you're, you're double booking yourself. So we now have through a lot of negotiations and work have a preliminary agreement that there will be an interlocal agreement so there'll be one judge on first appearances in a courtroom in the jail um, that can handle both the district court or not both, but the district court, the municipal court, and the superior court at the same time with one judge, prosecutor, public defender. We, in our system, about 20 to 25% of the people have multiple charges. So that's a pretty significant savings on that. It takes, again, some trust and negotiation and collaboration, but um, because everything's so expensive, we've been finding that people have been uh, more cooperative. Um, the other thing that we've been Talking about, we don't have a firm agreement on, but I'll share with you since uh, you're more progressive than my county counterparts at Spokane, is either getting rid of or uh, radically reducing cash bail. Um, so in our jail right now, there's about 200 people in the jail that are there on a cash or on a bail of $5,000 or less. And in order to post $5,000 bail, you need essentially $500. Uh, if you're there on a $1,000 bail, you just need $100 to get out. So there's 200 people there, not because they're considered dangerous, but they have not shown up for court several times. And the judge just doesn't know what else to do, but I'm going to put this. So they sit there because they're unreliable, not dangerous, uh, where we're paying, uh, again, $130 a day. And in counties that have gone to non-cash bail or other alternatives, um, the appearance rate of court has been the same. So they have not lost any appearances at court from going away from cash bail. Um, and some places have done, I think something, I'm not sure if you're considering this, but electronic notification of hearings for people on their cell phones. Uh, there are some people who I would consider true outlaws who are like, I'm never gonna go to court unless they take me in handcuffs there. But most people who don't, uh, they just have other stuff going on or they're irresponsible or they're a little scared or whatever, something, and if there's some structure around them showing up, whether it's a text message or they're on electronic home monitoring or uh, even a live phone call increases it. And every time you do that, you save about $1,400 according to some sources, plus you're not doing the jail time. Um, so people are looking at that. And I, I think I handed it up to the clerk. I don't know if she passed it out, but I, I have some web links for some of these things. And there's one down about two thirds of the way of a presentation to Spokane County about uh, cash bail and reducing it. Hasn't, again, hasn't been adopted yet because the county's not ready to do that yet. Um, one of the um, other things, big thing that's going on in the city that, that you guys are in a good position to possibly do is something called community court. And it's a therapeutic court system, we call it. But in Spokane, if you're uh, um, arrested for, we call them sort of downtown nuisance crimes, uh, you know, obstructing the sidewalk, uh, aggressive panhandling, using the alleys as your bathroom, uh, small shoplifting, um, things like that. Um, you can be diverted by the law enforcement officer to community court 
which uh, every Monday afternoon they set up in the downtown public library, not a court system, deliberately to be kind of different. They have sandwiches for the people who show up. Uh, the deputy prosecutor greets them at the door and shakes their hand and welcomes them to the court. And the first thing they do is they go to probation who does a full assessment of their criminal history, what their needs are, and then they go in front of the municipal court judge and um, she, because all three of our judges are she in Spokane, uh, sentences them to going to all the social service providers that they need and community service. And if they do all that over the next few weeks and come back, their uh, charge goes away. The social service providers are in the conference room next door to the courtroom. It's like a community service fair. And whether you need a driver's license, or, or not a driver's license, but a picture ID, whether you need health insurance, uh, whether you need housing, uh, whatever it is, you, you can go right there. So there's no excuse. They just can go right there. And what they're finding is that, again, the reoffense rate is plummeting for those same population of people. They're getting services. They're solving the problems that uh, contribute to them being disruptive. But my favorite part is the police officers have become social workers in effect. They're still keeping us safe and enforcing the law, but they get into relationship with these people and they're out on the streets helping keep these people uh, as constructive parts of society. And it's really a complete shift. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you get a sandwich when you graduate? Well, I think you, you get a sandwich every time you come to court. <laughs> so uh, that's a, just another little subtle uh, uh, enhancement there. And Seattle's been doing it for years, but we do it and it, again, very possible um, and the main thing really that we're looking at in, in criminal justice reform is instead of looking at the crime that the person got caught this time for, we're looking at the offender and figuring out how we can get them out of the system either permanently or mostly. Uh, a lot of people with mental health and addiction issues, you know, it's gonna, there's gonna be relapse, they're gonna come back. But that is the goal of it. And if I could summarize smart justice and criminal reform the way it's going these days, is it's becoming offender-based instead of offense-based. And it's way more successful uh, because you're dealing with uh, the problems that the person has as opposed to what they happen to get caught for this time. Um, let's see if I have any... That one other thing I wanted to talk about um, it, that we're doing, there's a whole re-entry aspect to criminal justice. So a lot of people go through the system and then they come out and now they can't get a job, they can't get housing, they can't get student loans. Uh, and so Spokane is starting to realize that even though politically at first it was difficult, is that we need to put targeted resources for people coming out of the system, otherwise they're gonna be back. And it's so expensive to incarcerate people, it's about 40,000 a year in Washington, that even though you're like, okay, if I have to choose between the person who needs a job who hasn't committed a crime and the person who has, I you know, kind of go to the person who hasn't. But what we've learned is that you have to focus on the people who are in the criminal system. Otherwise, they're gonna cost you way more and there's even less money to help people get jobs. So we have some community organizations that are gathering employers, private employers together to help uh, match people up. Um, and then we also, our city government, even though a very Republican mayor um, started a ban the box policy, which on employment applications for the city, you can't ask whether they have criminal history. Now you do get to ask them about it when you interview them and you get to do a full background check. And so you, it's not like you're hiring someone that you don't know, but you give the applicant a chance to explain their rehabilitation. And if they make the case, then uh, they're gainfully employed. Um, this spring, the city council is going to vote on whether or not to make that uh, citywide to all private employers in the city. Uh, and I just highlight that that's an issue that um, if you make it easier for people to re-enter, they're going to be less likely um, to re-offend. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention, and this is just Brian reading the Bellingham Herald from afar. Uh, and seeing about your Yakima uh, jail contract and, and trying to deal with this issue of being, I like someone said that you aren't kicked out of the jail but you are edged out of the jail, uh, is to really take the opportunity to say why are we gonna use the jail and what are we gonna use it for as I said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, my take on the jail for misdemeanors, municipal court, your jurisdiction, 
uh, as opposed to more serious crimes is you have to have jail cells for people who are driving under the influence because they have to go to jail and spend a night in jail or a day in jail. And you have to have it to protect viol uh, domestic violence victims. So you have to have a space for that. But beyond that, and then the last thing you have to have is for those offenders who won't follow through on their court mandated responsibilities and supervision and just won't do what they're supposed to do. You have to have what we call swift and certain sanctions where you can take them right to jail for a quick timeout and get back on the program. But beyond that, um, I think misdemeanor courts don't need as much jail space and jail time as they have in the past, given electronic home monitoring, given the alternative courts that I think you've been talking about, um, but we have a mental health court, a veterans court, a drug court, uh, DUI court, DV court, we have all these specialty courts that uh, take a rehabilitative approach um, on it. If you have all those things in place, you don't need as many uh, jail beds and you don't need to warehouse people, uh, even though sometimes that's uh, convenient. And I was telling um, Council Member Hamill that if I had any recommendation for you, aside from kind of the standard ones that I've talked about already and today, would be this. It would be to hire some professional person for the city whose job it is to keep your jail bed usage down. <laughs> it just said that is your job every day. Look into the person who's been hanging out on a $5,000 bail, but they're not dangerous. Why are they still there? Why hasn't their public defender gotten them out? You know, uh, look for people who are, um, they just, they're mentally ill, they need to be in treatment, something else, uh, get them out. Look at our, your procedures of what's going on, where you just say, hey, how can we get this person out of the jail and onto electronic home monitoring? Um, if you really had someone that that was their job, it would counteract all the people whose job it is to get people in jail, okay? <laughs> and we're a country of checks and balances, and it would be good to have a little bit of that balance to sort of put the system to the test, not from a public defender standpoint, because a public defender always has to stand up and say, get my person out of jail. <laughs> they, they have to, whether they think they should be out or not. But if you have someone from a systemic spot who says, in the interest of safety, saving money, reducing crime and transforming lives, it's consistent to get this person out of the jail cell and into some other intervention, I think that that would do you well and you would not be pushing up against your uh, ceiling at the jail. So. I think I'll end with that piece. Happy to answer any questions or just. Well, first of all, thank you so much. We really needed to hear this information and it's greatly appreciated. Council members, questions, thoughts? Council member Lilliquist. I, I want to start by saying that to uh, Mr. Beggs. Uh, very impressive what uh, Spokane has been able to accomplish, the county and the city. And I'd like us to reproduce uh, that kind of success in our own way. <laughs> um, uh, very timely. I remember hearing about Spokane like six, eight months ago. There's a presentation by the league, and uh, it's it sounds like. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong um, or right. It starts. It, it, I heard that Spokane also started out with gathering certain key information about who the users were, who was in jail, and why. In Whatcom County, there's been some frustration that the jail hasn't kept track of things for that purpose in the past, and so they can't always answer the questions that we want answered. How important was that that information and data gathering? How easy was that? How did that go? So it's vital, actually, as it turns out. I mean, our thing is just to be evidence-based. That's our that's our mantra. And that's our, our county prosecutor who, who has a lot in common with your county prosecutor. That is his mantra now, too. Evidence-based, evidence-based. And our jail used to not keep any statistics either. They just, they didn't, you, you didn't. Um, they do now, one of the catalysts is that we applied for a, um, a grant through the MacArthur Foundation, and we got a preliminary grant to help us apply for a bigger grant. And the beauty of that was that everyone sort of got on the same page for a while. And so now we have that data. That, that, was, the, that was the jump start to get it because they saw money at the end of the day to do that. But, but you need the evidence, and we right now have a, we, we have most of the evidence now, but it was not, it was not easy to get, and it wasn't until the county really understood why it would be helpful to them as well. I mean, you're kind of a, a customer of the county, right. so it might be more important to you than to them. But once they understood that it would be helpful to them, uh, they got behind it. Um, and so it was helpful. And one of the things we have, a, one of our subcommittees that's working on reform is called the Performance Measures Subcommittee. And they've essentially been debating what data do we want 
and how to display it on a website so it can actually be tracked. And include, it includes how many people are in jail at any one day, what the reoffense rate is, uh, what the costs are. And so just you kind of have the, we'd call it a dashboard, you go on the website and you can see it. And so that's not done yet, but that is where we're going to. Um, and then if you have that data, you can make the policy argument. For so long, it was just trust us, we'll take care of you. That was the, the approach. And now with data, um, that's what drives things because one of the things, the, the back sheet of this uh, piece of paper is a, a, a report from the Washington Institute of Public Policy, which is um, the second uh, website that I have on the first page. They have study after study and report after report of what works and what doesn't work in both adult and juvenile corrections. And they just, you know, they just spell it out so you don't have to uh, make a, an argument just based on hope. Um, so, but you need the data to do it. So, yes. Follow up. Yeah, please. Hmm? Please. Uh, so, um, I do know there are uh, certainly leaders in the county side who also are very much interested in, in evidence-based approach. You said it was hard at first. Could you leave us with a short list of maybe the, the measures that you've found most useful so we could focus our data gathering there? Sure. So I would say the big aha for uh, me when I first started getting it was finding out what I told you right at the beginning is that only 18% of the people in the jail were serving a sentence. Um, but it was a completely different issue. And 50% of the people there are pretrial, which means they have not been convicted yet and they are in jail. Uh, so that was the first most important. Another thing that was important for us in Spokane and continues to be is the racial demographics in the jail. Uh, if you're African American, you're five times more likely to be in the jail than if you're Caucasian, and if you're Native American, three times. And for a long time, the government leaders pushed back on, they didn't even want to talk about that, but now they've created a racial equity subcommittee as well as part of our reform issue to just put that lens on it. Is this going to help or not? Um, understanding how many people have mental health issues in the jail, that's got to be up there. And you know, the, it's all sorts of discussion about, well, what is a real mental health diagnosis? I mean, my assessment based on our jail is it's probably 60% or higher. Um, illiter functional illiteracy is probably about 70%. And so those kind of demographics, which would all be collected if you get that assessment tool up and running, that, that would collect, um, collect most of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a perception out there that there's a, a liability to a jurisdiction mm -hmm. um, if a person is um, ho electronically home monitored and then commits an offense while they're under that program, what is the liability to, say, the city of Bellingham? Um, so with the disclaimer that I'm not your lawyer, uh, but, but also the, the knowledge that in my day job, I often sue governments, yeah. <laughs> including jails and things, for exactly that cause of action. It's very difficult to win a case like that. The typical case is someone who's served their sentence and they're under the Department of Corrections felony uh, probation, supervision, and if the person is totally acting out and the Department of Corrections supervisor just doesn't do anything uh, and then they commit a crime, that yeah, they, they'll, they'll be held liable. So the, there's three levels of ways to avoid liability. The first is to use that assessment tool so you are not electronic home monitoring people um, who are dangerous. So that's the first thing. And if you do that right and you have a good tool, the presumption is going to be you've done nothing wrong and you're not liable. Uh, for the city of Bellingham in particular, it would be misdemeanor supervision. And the standard for proving fault on that is much higher than uh, felony. It's gross negligence instead of regular negligence. Um, and then the second thing is the Court of Appeals recently decided a case that says if the person who's being supervised absconds, meaning sort of leaves uh, supervision and the supervising agency requests a warrant, all liability is cut off. So as long as your supervisors are actually doing their job, putting out the right people, and then if somehow someone slips through and they, they, go, they go off on a runner, so to speak, if you re request that warrant, the liability goes away. So in my opinion, it's minimal liability, especially compared to the massive savings, so. Thank you. 
Good evening, Brother Councilmember Barker. So thank you. It was um, very enlightening to listen to what you had to say. I had uh, two questions, one on the community court. Mm -hmm. Did you guys model that after something else or did you build your own? So we modeled it or we were inspired at least by Seattle. Okay. And they've had one for um, longer, way longer, but we made it like you always have to do. We made it uniquely yeah. um, Spokane. And I, again, I would like the having it at the library, I think was kind of a Spokane thing. Okay, and then the um, ban the box, which was interesting because I was just looking this up this morning after yeah. I was reading your letter to the governor, and um, and you may not be able to answer this question, but it sounds like you guys have had it for about a year. We have had it uh, about a year for okay. city employment C only. City employment. City employment. And yeah. and do you know have they hired anybody they wouldn't have been likely to hire before? I have not heard a report. Okay. Uh, about I, that. I can ask. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, good. Uh, yeah. Next time I'm there, I will, I will uh, ask that question. I don't know, frankly, I don't know how many people they've actually hired in the city of Spokane <laughs> in the last year. It's more of a symbolic yeah. kind of piece. Um, but there are, you know, Target has adopted the ban the box mm -hmm. and there's other major employers and S Seattle has done that in other places. And it's actually uh, potential avoiding liability because uh, our criminal justice system is so disproportionate on race. Uh, the EEOC is now giving guidance to employers that you better have a pretty darn good reason if you're going to use uh, criminal history as, as a determining factor. Uh -huh. I applaud your community for doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember yeah. Borneman. Yeah, one, just want to say glad to see you're still fighting the good fight. Yep. And But uh, about the ban the box, I've recently been hearing about some cities that are looking at banning the box when it comes to housing, right. that not being able to deny housing based on, you know, right right now a lot of times if you got a felony, you yep. might as well not even yep. apply. And so to try to get people, it's such a necessity in reentry to get people back into housing and stable housing. Has Spokane looked at that? No, you know, actually at, at lunch today we were talking exactly that same mm. issue and it was sort of the first time I had even thought about it, but it's the same principle. Yeah. And again, for people who aren't as familiar, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that a landlord would have to rent to a felon. It just means you would actually have to talk with them <laughs> first right. before you made the call because otherwise people just make two stacks of applications. So I personally think uh, it totally needs to be explored because Housing and employment are uh, huge triggers for future criminal activity. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Councilman Real Bruce. quick, thank you. The uh, jail diversion facility funded by Medicaid, is that something new? It's, real, it's, it's not brand new. Um, uh, Seattle has one and Yakima has one. I think what's new about it, and I don't know when it was, is the Medicaid regulations changed. Uh, and uh, essentially it has to be 16 beds or less. Uh, and then, you know, the income requirements for Medicaid have been expanded. Uh, so I think it's relatively new. And I, just to make a quick point about it, so the first savings is you're putting someone in this facility instead of the jail. The jail you pay for, this facility Medicaid mostly pays for. Um, but the second thing is the, the model is they're there for about 24 to 72 hours and they get trans uh, ported out to another kind of intermediate. So they're not in an acute, but they're still not in jail. So it's not just the first couple of days that they're not in jail. They're not in jail for the typical two to three to four weeks that someone would be. So even though it's 16 beds, which seems modest and is, you're really, each time you take someone in for one of those 16, you're, you're saving maybe 24 or 26 nights of jail. And then the last thing about it is uh, benefit is that the reoffense rate goes down. They've studied that in Yakima and in Seattle. The people who go through that either don't reoffend or take longer to reoffend, or when they do reoffend, reoffend at a less, uh, smaller level. And one conversation I had with Sheriff Elfo uh, this morning was he says, Boy, I wish it was an involuntary lockup. And I said, well, yeah, state law, that's kind of tricky to do, but the way we're proposing it in Spokane, and we haven't done it yet, but we're going, and it's the jail who wants us to do it, by the way, it's, uh, is we're gonna have it very close to the jail, and the officer who's got probable cause to arrest someone says, I'm taking you to the jail, or you seem like you could benefit from this triage, or you can go here, so it's your choice, it's voluntary. <laughs> and they go there, 
uh, if they want to, so it's voluntary. But, and if they want to leave, they can, but it's right by the jail, so they call and say, okay, the person's leaving. And Sheriff Elfo seemed, at least in the moment that we had, he goes, okay, no, that would, that would work for me, uh, given state law. So it's, um, it really fills a gap that we have, because the reason our jail wants it, there's so many mentally ill people there that they really can't handle, and to have uh, Medicaid pay for it instead of local people. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it gives us many things to think about and definitely a lot of hope. So we really appreciate it. And while this was for information only, I just want to assure the community that this work is going to continue because Council Member Hamill, for example, is on the Incarceration Reduction Task Force for our area. So we will be exploring so many of these options and many others. Is there anything you wanted to add? Along with uh, Mayor Linville. Along with On Mayor the task force. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And many others. <laughs> okay. All right. So, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Good luck, and don't, don't hesitate to call again. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next item is a resolution to end the Clean Green program, and we will hear from Ted Carlson from Public Works. Good afternoon, Ted Carlson, Public Works Department, along with Eric Johnston. Um, as the council is aware, we've been discussing the Clean Green Transfer Station for the last three or four years, and each year taking an opportunity to evaluate uh, the program, looking at uh, the money that it takes to subsidize the program, even though we've been increasing the fees over the last 10 years or so, the gate fees. The program still does not support itself and requires a subsidy from the city's solid waste utility tax, solid waste fund. So every year we wanna look at that subsidy, look how much it is, and then also reprioritize or prioritize the other potential uses for that funding. And the primary use that staff sees for the solid waste utility tax is helping to fund the waterfront remediation activities. So before you or in your packet was a two-page summary of the program. Uh, along with the resolution, and we can discuss the resolution after uh, Eric Johnston provides a brief presentation on uh, kind of the history of Clean Green, but also where we stand after the end of 2015. Thank you. Eric Johnston, Public Works Department. And w one thing to add on to what Ted had to say about timing, it, it, excuse me, relates to the timing of why this presentation now. And so one of the things we are anxious to do is be ready for the service, whether it exists or not, and to have time to be ready for that to start or not, as the case may be. So here we are in January. The service typically has started in April, late March, early April. In order to be prepared to start in April, if we proceed forward, we need to have time to prep the site and be ready for bidding, or to take a different avenue if the council is so wishing to, to not continue the program, to support outreach efforts for alternatives for the community. So we're coming to you in January to be ready for that decision. And based on your decision, be ready to start something uh, for the spring time frame. So a brief presentation starting with the history of the Clean Green program. This was started in 1989 as a pilot program with its intent really to be an option for people to bring yard waste materials that would then be composted and, composted and used locally within the community. Hence the title of Clean Green. Clean material, green material being used in a responsible fashion. It proceeded, proceeded over time. In 1994, the city and the county uh, started the project to evenly split the cost as a no-fee service. Uh, that, that service became rapidly became very popular. It's a very well-loved program in the community. Uh, it's been used for many, many years. Uh, in 2004, as the amount of material really became very large and needed to have a way to be able to support the cost to support that much material, there were a couple of things that happened. First of all, we started issuing a bid to have the material hauled to a different location because it was more material than the city could absorb and use for its own purposes and needs. And so with that, the material started being trucked to Skagit County as the low bid for the hauler uh, to be removed as a waste product rather than reused as a, as, a, as, a, as a recyclable product. And then you see a series of fee increases as the costs continue to rise, as the county starts to removing funding from the program, the city starts to raise the fees to try to minimize the amount of money the city was putting in to support that program. 
And most recently in 2014, the City Council increased the fee from $5 to $10 uh, for a single uh, load of material to clean green. In 2015, these are the actuals for last year, we had $195,000 in expenses. That's our labor, that's our staff labor, that's materials to operate it, and service contracts, which is largely the hauling out to Skagit County. Uh, about $109,000 in revenue, uh, which means there was about $85,000 in, in subsidies from the solid waste fund. So the funding for this program is generated off the, off the bills that are paid or, or, or operations that are done by solid waste providers in the community. There's a tax on that service, that tax comes to the city, that tax is used to fund this individual program. Uh, since 2002, which is as far back as my spreadsheets go, uh, we have the city alone has contributed more than $1.6 million in subsidy to that. The county has also contributed to it, but I didn't run those numbers. In 2015, about 31 percent, this is really just on an anecdotal reporting of people coming in, we say, where are you from, the city or the county? So about 31 percent of the total users were, were folks who indicated they lived in the county. Actually, let me go back a slide here. Oops. So on that 31% users are from the county, so historically back in the 90s, early 2000s, it was roughly about 10 to 15% of the users from the county. And as the number of users has declined, the number of the percentage of county users has increased. So it's hard to say whether we have, uh, what is causing that, but the total percentage of users is from, being from the county is, is going up. And I think largely what's happening is the number of city users is dropping, the county users is largely staying constant. So we're not seeing more users from the county, it's just the declining numbers that change out. So with that, uh, those, those trends, what we're seeing here is over time that the, even though we are seeing the decline in the number of users, the amount of material we're receiving at the clean green facility is largely remaining unchanged. And the result of that is this green line here which shows that the average load per customer is increasing. So we see the total number of customers dropping from 2004 time frame and you see these increases and, and drop. As fees increase, the number of customers drops. Uh, to this 2014, when we went to $10, it dropped, continued to drop. The total tonnage that we were hauling to Skagit County is largely constant, which means that each individual user, as an average, is, is going up. Now, clearly there are folks who bring a small load of grass clippings, but there are folks who bring in a very, very large loads, and so the average, average load is about 590 pounds per customer. In 2016, there are a couple things that we are expecting to see for if we continue to operate clean green. We, we do need to issue the hauling contract again for bidding uh, and would expect to see an increase in cost for that hauling contract. We have a, a very large capital expense that has been deferred for many, many years as we don't have necessary dollars to, to pay for those improvements. Uh, one thing that was talked about that came with the council in 2014 was the potential to do a weight-based fee system. That would require the installation of a scale that's very commonly used within the industry. If you go to the other providers, you weigh in and you weigh out and they, they charge you for the load. Uh, and a way to, to measure and cashier that, uh, right now, this, as you folks know, it's a, it's a box. You put your cash in the box and that gets counted on Monday morning and, and, and that's not necessarily accurate or precise and, and some people give more and some people give less and so it's not a really precise way of, of handling the cash. Uh, we do need to deal with the stormwater management as, as we are trying to be responsible for our stormwater uh, uh, quality and quantity, there are very few provisions on that site for stormwater protection and we would need to add those into, the, into that site for our own compliance with our own ordinances and policies. We're guessing that in 2016 upwards of $250,000 in operating expenses, that's on the high end, we're trying to be conservative, uh, at about $100,000 in fee revenue, again on the, high, on the low end to be conservative, uh, but still <laughs> indicating that we'd have a subsidy for 2016 again. So what are our alternatives to clean green? And this is a big difference between where the city and the community was at in 1989 or to early, early 1990s to today. And it, when the city started the clean green program, there were no other alternatives for really of any note uh, for disposal of, of organic debris from your yard. Today there are three specific services that are available. RDS uh, on the north side of town will take that, that green material at point, um, three cents a pound. Uh, Green Earth Technology is a composting facility north of town up towards Linden off the Hannigan Road at two cents a pound. And SSC will pick up that material at your curbside for a, for a small monthly fee. And we'll also pick up other larger debris for a fee as well. Uh, one of the nice things about the county is that all three of these private enterprises are connected together. All of the material collected by RDS or and SSC is hauled to Green Earth Technology. 
All of that material is composted by Green Earth Technology and avail made available for resale within Whatcom County. So these are local, pro local companies, local providers, providing local jobs and local services. The city buys compost from Green Earth Technology. Uh, we, we, we've done our typical, well, my, my crews went out and said, what's a typical load? What would that cost somebody? They took a, an F-150 pickup truck, a standard pickup truck, loaded it full of debris and hauled it up to RDS and it was about 300 pounds. And so a typical load to RDS would be about $10. It's a little bit more of a drive, uh, but if we compare the cost of what it costs us to, to dispose of a load, uh, including the subsidy as to what it would cost a customer to go to RDS, it's about the same price. So that gets us to where do we, what, are, what are our options as a community or as a city to, to look at uh, and obviously want to provide options. We can continue the service with an increased subsidy. There's, we can continue to do that as a community. We could increase the fee. The downside to increasing the fee is we would see that continuing trend. We'd get fewer customers and likely would not see a, draw, a, a change in the tonnage. Uh, we could issue an RFP for a provider to do a site lease on that property. Uh, that is certainly an option, but would likely see an increase for the price uh, from the private providers over, over what is available currently in the community. They would need to pay not only for the use of that property, they would need to bring that property up to the current standard for stormwater, and that would be an expensive proposition. We could reduce the service period. We could do it uh, a fewer number of weekends. We would still uh, be faced with the, our costs are higher to operate that that could be done by the private sector. Or we could do something which they think, we think is a, is a viable option, is offer a, a, a short-term free service to manage large storm debris for large storm events. We did this in, in, April, in August of this year. So with the August windstorms, we offered a, about a one-week period, free come drop off your large woody debris, your, your branches, your trees that have fallen down. Uh, we were able to take that material and for about five to $10,000, use that material, grind it up, and how have used that for city projects or will be using that for city projects in the future. So in one sense, getting back to the original intent of the Clean Green Program, uh, dealing with the large debris that is not readily available to be dealt with by SSC's curbside pickup or somebody hauling up to Green Earth Technology, but deal with those things on a time, on, a, on, a, on an as-needed basis. So building on that, looking at those options, uh, what our recommendation is, is to continue that discontinue the weekend service, eliminate the Clean Green Program as it exists today, uh, provide two free cleanup weekends, or cleanup weeks as, as the case may be, we need to talk about that. We want to avoid large lines, try to people get in there, um, but offer a spring cleanup and a fall cleanup for the large tree branches, the, the ivy that's gotten out of control, the blackberries in the, in the, in the lot or whatever, uh, to do that free of charge uh, at a very low cost to the city between fit ten and $20,000 for those two free weekends then be able to use that material locally within the city. Also plan for storm, storm response. So if we get a big winter storm or a big spring storm that uh, causes a lot of debris to fall in the city to be able to respond to that as well, that's a function of the city to deal with solid waste management. Uh, use that material that we collect for city operations both in parks and for public works for natural resources uh, to use that material here in the community. And then reprioritize staff and fund litter control, waterfront cleanups and abatements. One of the concerns that comes up is, will people just be dumping their, their yard waste at the end of the cul-de-sac? Well, to some extent, people do that now. And our ability to reprioritize and take the existing staff who are currently working on Clean Green and divert their attention, their focus to other activities to pick up the TVs and the couches and the, and the debris that gets dumped on the end of the street. So the, the resolution is, is to that and is to that recommendation is to discontinue or eliminate the Clean, clean Green program for 2016. Just, just to add to the why, um, whoa. Uh, I think Eric's made a few good points, and one of them is there was a purpose for this program when it started. We didn't have alternatives. When I first became mayor and figured out we had an environmental program where we were trucking our, our compost to Skagit County on the highway and we weren't, gonna get, and we weren't getting to use it, it seemed like the environmental purpose of the program was a little bit lost. And with the alternatives we have now to actually support um, economic activities in our own community, be able to use the compost ourselves, I just told Ted maybe we need to get a, some kind of a, what, a, a, a percentage of the compost that we can use without paying for it, I don't know. Um, but the other po point is environmentally, we're talking about our climate change action plan and our 
and our climate impacts, it does not make any sense to me that we would take this material and ship it down to Skagit County. And as Eric said, we can't use it all ourselves. So in my mind, if there's somebody else who is doing a service for the same or less cost, and it has both an environmental and an economic benefit, it's certainly something that I hope the council will consider. Council members, Council Member Lilliquist. Well, I've um, been resistant to giving up the, the Clean Green program because it, it, it is uh, very popular among a certain segment. It, it definitely has filled an important need. I think there's still an important need, um, but the economics aren't working. And um, I like the alternative you come up with, which has two features. One, the, the, the seasonal spring and fall uh, period where people can, when we kind of expect people to have large woody debris. That's really, I think, the problem. It's, it, glass, grass clippings, not so much. But if you've got any size yard, every now and then you're going to have huge amounts of debris to get rid of, more than you can stuff in that toter. Um, so there's that. There, that brief seasonal thing and then also I really appreciate the the storm response um, which cannot be anticipated and for both of those I think the challenge is publicity education and communication unless our public knows right after a storm event hey this is one of those things we've triggered the protocol next Saturday you know bring your branches you've got a week to get that work done um, and also so the public knows hey April let's make a tax day April 15th or whatever it is you know, we're going to have the clean woody debris because I, one of the reasons for the program originally is there was problems with dumping and I don't want the problem with dumping to reemerge. So I guess my comment is this will really, the alternative that the staff's testing really hinges upon the communications and the awareness. And so can I get your reaction to that and what you anticipate that we can do along those lines? I think that's a good point. I think uh, absolutely the communication, the awareness, the outreach when those events are going to take place would be uh, of primary importance and I think that's something we certainly would be committed to do through the various uh, channels that are available to us. I think we're becoming a little bit better at that all the time. Public Works has a communication outreach person now that can work in conjunction with the mayor's office and, and make sure that we do everything we can to get the word out. Uh, this year as an example, uh, and it was a fairly fast turnaround, certainly there was a, a large number of people that took advantage of the free dump that we had near Civic Field. So I think that it is important to make sure that we do that, but I think it's something that we can certainly work work at and be successful in getting the word out. Okay, Council Member Barker. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, for one, am, I'd love to see this go to a private operator and have the city um, allow that opportunity for somebody in Bellingham. I'm surprised, uh, it would be great if we could find a place in Bellingham so they're paying taxes to us and we're actually making a revenue. <coughs> Is there any plans? Does it seem to be anything in works if somebody's interested in taking up something like this? Well, we have uh, been approached in the past by folks that were considering opening up a um, clean green type facility in the city of Bellingham and one of the big hurdles has always been yeah. the city's operation, the fact that we subsidize um, the city's operation making it more challenging for someone to come in and operate a private facility to have someone come in and, and operate at our existing site is problematic in that as eric mentioned the infrastructure improvements that are needed um, are very expensive and those have to happen whether the city continues to operate it or whether or not a private contractor comes in to operate it but i think what we would likely see is if the city stepped back from a clean green type facility that there would be people interested within the city limits in some of our industrial areas of pursuing a, um, a site like clean green in the city limits rather than having to drive up to Slater which is just outside the city's UGA and certainly there's a perspective that that's um, and it is a further drive although it's uh, you know almost in the city's UGA it's not as far as people think it is um, but I think that we would likely see people enter into that business. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised with all the environmentally minded yeah. and landscape people that we have. The, um, the other one for me is if we were to keep the two, two weekends, it sounds like regular, and then also the storm events is that if somebody were to open a facility that we might revisit that 20,000 that we're putting out 
and either we could um, put it into subsidies for people to have work with SSC or we could um, do more outreach on storm event days where people don't have the truck to get to the place that we're opening up. So um, I'd like, if we do pass this, to maybe have some type of trigger in there that we can revisit that if we do have a private operation open. Thank you. Sure. Councilmember Hamill. Two questions related to finances. Um, on page 42 in the packet, it says that the improvements necessary to bring the clean green site into compliance with the city and state um, water quality and stormwater uh, control um, standards are going to add one million dollars to the program expenses and it further goes on to say that the added program expenses will increase fiscal pressure on the solid waste fund which is facing more than 30 million dollars in liability for waterfront uh, cleanups and that's the uh, coming out of the fund 440 of the solid waste fund is the is the concern that there, there's this one million dollar improvement that's looming that's triggering this um, request or is it that and the ongoing um, city subsidy to help operate the program? It's, it's really both. It's really both. It's the, uh, regardless of the $1 million in, in needed infrastructure, the subsidy required for the ongoing operational expenses is something that staff has been looking at and the mayor's been looking at. Looking at that near $100,000 a year just in operating expenses that could potentially go to something like helping to pay the debt service even on an environmental cleanup project down on the waterfront. But when you add in the million dollars in capital improvements and where we would try to fund that out of the solid waste fund, uh, it becomes even more problematic. Perhaps we look at that site in the future and do something different there. Uh, what is the highest and best use of the clean green facility site? And uh, that's an analysis that the city needs to go through. But regardless, at this point, uh, the city, the state, stormwater regulations would require significant upgrade that doesn't seem reasonable given the finances in the solid waste fund. Thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. Thank you. The numbers don't lie. They never do. This is staggering the amount of money we have spent over the last few years, whether the county was with us or not, that wouldn't change anything. My point is to go a step further. If we do, and I'm going to support the resolution that we do get out of this reluctantly. I was here when we started it. I thought it would be great, but it didn't work out. Um, the property, I, I know you'll probably look at that if we pass this resolution because I think one way of us getting our money back is to somehow, if we don't need the property, if you use part of Civic yeah, Field cool. Complex to mm -hmm. dump stuff, then we might be able to get something back for our years of investment. It has been a popular program. I steadily go there during the summertime, but I've seen the drop too. There used to be a lineup to get in and now there isn't anymore. So. It's unfortunate, but that's a lot of money we've spent. We can't continue to do that. So, Councilmember Performance. Yeah, I've been a big supporter of it, and I, I actually think it works, <laughs> you know, and it, it has worked. Yes, we subsidized it, but we haven't had to, to deal with the, the mess that we had previously of the dumping around the arboretums, the parks, and just as we predicted when we raised the fees, we're seeing that again. You know, we're, you know, I hear complaints from people over at Sinclair Park that where they're dumping along there around uh, uh, Lake Watka, uh, Watkin mm -hmm. Falls Park, the Arboretum. You know, people are doing that. So I'm glad to see staff acknowledge that that's happening and going to happen, and we we're going to put staff to deal with some of that because it's just it's going to happen. You know, when we, when we make it too expensive with it. Um, I'll probably support it simply because I can count. But I would like to, since we're not going to, you know, this property, Gene was making a point about, you know, a little bit about the property. This is a value, I think, a valuable piece of property, especially the location of it. And to make it feel a little better, I would like to at least see us consider, I mean, what a wonderful place with that that area on bus lines and everything else, you know, we're always talking about uh, us centering low income housing in the downtown and other areas. Well, what a wonderful spot that would be to be able to partner with a provider of low income housing. And that would take the sting away from me a little bit if we would <laughs> consider that. So I'm just throwing that out there for thought because, I mean, that is a, 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 would be a great spot near 
right on bus lines near schools. So just to throw it out there. Yeah, thank you. And I think certainly if the council does support the resolution and we and we look to deal with, uh, you know, change the operation there, that's the next discussion to sit down mm -hmm. with the mayor and the planning director and parks director and, and city staff and then certainly work with the council on what, what is the next use for that site. Councilmember Lilliquist. <laughs> Throw your pen there, Michael. Yeah, uh, Terry, that's a really uh, it's a nifty idea. Uh, we should look at that, definitely. Um, if we did surplus this property, which is the first process, is we declare it surplus, and then we could go out with some kind of proposal or, or bidding process, and let's say we sold it for, I don't know, a million dollars, whatever it is. Um, that money right now, we just go to the general fund. It doesn't belong to the solid waste fund, or there's parks operations on some of that property. Is it just, we don't even know who, I mean, it's just generally owned by the city at this I, point. I think it's generally owned by the city. I don't believe it's owned or vested in the solid waste fund as an asset of the solid waste fund. Council Member Hamill, please. Would any entity that builds affordable housing or repurposes the site face the same $1 million in costs in stormwater and, and water quality mitigation? Yeah, so whatever's developed there would have to comply with, um, you know, our current stormwater code, um, both city, state, stormwater requirements. And so there would certainly have to deal with their stormwater runoff through detention and water quality. Uh, but that would be typical of any new development. Uh, transfer facility like Clean Green has some unique challenges, especially the way it's constructed now that uh, are a little bit different. But yeah, there would definitely be infrastructure costs associated with whatever happens there. Councilmember Barker. So uh, it sounds like this might pass, and I just want to extend a, a gratitude to the employees that have been working there. I, we've utilized it until last year. Um, we found we could go to RDS for about the same price in any day of the week. So we started doing that, and I think that they, um, they keep their, their stuff local after they compost it. So, um, but to the employees, they interacted extremely well with the community, and you almost went just to go say hi to them sometimes. So I hope that we'll find a place for them where they're interacting with the community again. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Public Works employees uh, that have worked at Clean Green, it's just one of the duties for most of them. They, the rest of their uh, work week is spent working on the street crew or in other solid waste activities. So yeah, we value the work they've done up there and uh, certainly find other opportunities for them. Is there a motion? I'll move the resolution. Second. Okay, great. Sorry, Siri, I'm not asking for you. Siri agrees. <laughs> <laughs> so the motion on the floor is to pass the resolution to end the Clean Green program. Is there anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Seeing none, this passes 6-0 with Councilmember Vargas excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item is a mayor's request to Governor Jay Inslee to declare a state of emergency on homelessness. Mayor Linville, will you please guide us through? So what you have before you is a letter um, that was drafted by my office. Um, when I was observing what other communities were doing and what they were doing was they were they were declaring um, a state of emergency in their own communities, like Seattle did. And I just want to compliment um, our council members and our community because we really have taken advantage of almost every tool we have in order to help with this issue. We have, um, as a part of the county family, we have passed the behavioral health tax, we've passed uh, a one-tenth of a percent for um, alternative um, triage, triage center that we have out in Iron Gate. We've done the home fund. We put general fund money into uh, services for homeless. Um, we made, an, uh, as a city, made enormous investments this year with the HOT team and intensive case management and community paramedics and community police officers, and I can go down the list. What I was trying to do was to raise this issue as something that was a statewide issue, um, not just for our community, that I think has responded as quickly and as um, completely as they can right now, but to say this is a, an issue for everybody. Now, um, in conversations with the governor's office, um, 
the governor's office is also supportive of the things we're asking for, obviously. <clears throat> and what their concern was about a state of a state of emergency is normally state of emergencies that are called by the governor are state of emergencies for non-human caused activities like a Oso landslide or the forest fires in eastern Washington, those type of things. Now in Hawaii, they did do a statewide call. So um, I am ready and prepared to send a letter, the same as I, I was before, but we've also had an offer from the governor's office to coordinate with the Washington uh, Association of Cities, the Washington, the I mean AWC and uh, Washington Association of Counties, and the governor's office to raise this issue at the state level, which is was my goal, and to coordinate our advocacy for both programs that the governor was um, advocating for and programs that we think would be helpful. So I just wanted to put that out there that I was in full, you know, I was ready to, just to send this letter as is, but my goal is to raise the level of awareness and I wanna make sure that I am doing that the best way possible. So I just wanted to let you know that there is potentially a, an option there for us which would get everybody who needs to be involved in this conversation coordinated at the state level. And I think that's, that's really the goal. So uh, while I was just doing this as a, a point of information, I was gonna send the letter forward. I just wanted you to know that potentially I might be rethinking what I'm doing or doing it a different way. Um, I would still be interested if the council wanted to you know, partner with me on sending the letter. I'm very happy about that. But I think in some ways now we've already achieved our goal in that I was contacted by the governor's office, so. Well, Kelly, I appreciate you keeping an eye on, on this issue. Um, whether or not there's a state of emergency, it's an important issue that, as you say in your letter, um, there are state level approaches that we need. So the, the second half of your letter has three sections with bullet points on policies that we would like to see happen or that you say you would like to see happen and they look really good to me too. Um, so whether or not we talk about it in state of emergency or not, it seems like those are points that can and should be part of our legislative agenda going forward. I think we have some language in our legislative agenda. It speaks in far more <coughs> general terms. So I'm, I'm wondering maybe a reaction from the council as well, looking at those bullet points. I mean, this is sort of already what we have on legislative agenda. Would we like to give some sort of more specific endorsement to the administration that these are some of the specifics that might flesh out that more general legislative piece? And if I could just add, there are other things um, in talking to the governor's office that we could also add that are in the works now. And that's one, one of the requests they made of us is can you support you know, this extra $4 million and this housing money and this, and we said yes, of course. Anything that will give us more resources to deal with the problem, we're happy to, to support. So um, I just want you to know that it wouldn't necessarily be limited to those things and having this on our legislative agenda means that our lobbyists could be bringing forward these issues as they come forward in the legislature. That's why we make the categories fairly broad so that opportunistically, if there's something that would benefit the cause, um, would get us towards our goal, that we could advocate for it. But I'm a little excited about this, I have to admit, because this has been a goal of mine for a couple years, so. All right, Council Member Hamill, then Borneman. Okay. I just wanted to get the governor's office's reaction. You had mentioned that they, they had made contact with you and you mentioned just some points here. Were there other any other animating points that the governor's office wanted to discuss or bring forward? Um, I think that they, I had a little list here. I was keeping track as we were having our conversation. Um, first of all, I think we should compliment the governor's office and the legislature for what they've done. Everybody likes to know that what they've done is being acknowledged. So I'm gonna do that on the record right now. 
Um, secondly, there is some extra funding that is coming through on the supplemental budget, which is um, $4 million in addition to the 75 that was in the biennial budget. There is a source of income, and I think we had that on our, our list. Uh, consolidated homeless grants is something that the governor's office was working on. And then also um, reentry mental health step down programs. I said anything with mental health, that's what we deal with on the alternatives task force quite a bit anyway. And then there may be other things. And <clears throat> I've been asked to serve on a panel, a homeless panel for AWC during the um, AWC days. And so I'm gonna do that. And we're gonna have um, a list, kind of a, a, my job will be to talk about what the city is involved in and trying to do. And then um, uh, meeting with the governor's staff to talk about what a, a more fleshed out coordinated message um, for our legislators too. So that could be whatever is in the works down there. It's pretty fluid. Councilmember Borneman. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate the thought behind the letter and what's there. And this, us sending this letter and with you does not preclude doing all the other on the yeah. statewide. Because I still think it's a good idea because I think what you're saying is, is true. You know, in this city we are, in a way, it's a state of an emergency in terms of the cost of our housing compared to our income and the amount of people who are locked out of the housing uh, market, whether it's rental or, or whatever. I mean, there is, and, and we have kind of hit the end of where we, we tried most everything, and this does outline things that we need to be, continue to work on. So for me, I would prefer that we do, we sign on to you and with you to send the letter and pursue those others on the statewide level. And I would, I would support Councilmember Borneman's um, opinion on that. I think uh, if there's any doubt that there's a state of emergency in our community, um, um, folks should just consider that there's an average of one child in every classroom in the um, in Bellingham schools who is experiencing homelessness. To me, that's a, that's a, an emergency. So, and I do want to commend the mayor for putting this together. And um, I, it sounds like there might be some further things, additions to this document. But I did want to commend you for um, calling out um, House Bill 2263. I think that's an instrument that um, county communities and or city communities later, if it's not, um, uh, if, if the county does not uh, use their authority to um, provide for services through that specific me uh, mechanism, that's a um, uh, small sales tax, and also the REIT or the real estate excise tax. So thank you, Mayor, for putting this together. All we need is a motion. I will move that we uh, join the mayor in sending the, uh, uh, the letter to the governor preparing the almost emergency in the state of Washington. Second. Okay, great. The motion has been made and seconded. Councilmember Lukowicz. I will be voting to support joining in this letter. And, and the one thing that I emphasize is the statistic that you cited is, is painful. It's a painful statistic. But this isn't saying that Bellingham alone is facing a sense of emergency. Our housing problems, in some sense, as the mayor indicated, are being maybe more actively addressed in our community than others. This is a statewide issue, and that's what the letter says. And we're asking for a statewide solution. So th this isn't saying that Bellingham is in crisis. We're saying, broadly speaking, and actually across the country, in many communities, housing affordability is an issue. It's not something created here, and it's not something that will be solved here alone. So I, I, I want to make sure that, that people understand that, that it's a broad focus we're taking. Councilmember Barker, please. So there were um, a, a couple of public comments that came in regarding increasing um, taxes if we're already uh, having higher housing costs than what a lot of people can afford. But I looked this up and, it, and I think what you were just saying is that uh, this can be something that we decide to ask the voters to pass and don't directly pass ourselves. Is that correct? That's correct. The other, the other thing, and because I got some of those same comments, yeah. I bet you surprised. Um, my, my, one of the things that I want to acknowledge, which Michael was talking about, is we have already 
voted to raise assessments on our community at least four times. And some communities haven't done that yet. So when I was at the last um, AWC meeting that I went to in, I can't remember where it was, down in King, King or Snohomish County, the, um, when they were talking about what Bellingham had done, we kind of, we got kudos for the steps we've taken. So that is one thing that I responded to with the people that I were calling my office is, this is ta raising this issue to a statewide level and not necessarily saying Bellingham needs to do this, 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 because I believe that um, our residents have, have done a lot and it w could be or would be um, something that the, the citizens could vote on if we decided to do something else. But as always, we have to look at our affordability as well as our homeless issue in our community just because they're both factors. Yeah. But this is, this is kind of taking it out of what Bellingham's doing and putting it into what I believe the state and then kind of pushing up to the federal government should be doing. Yeah, there's a um, quote, and I'm going to not give the person credit because I can't remember who said it, but it's uh, said it's easier to um, build a strong child than, than to fix a broken adult. And I think, I think that we're seeing that, that this is certainly a symptom of a much larger problem and having the planning director here and all the stuff that we've learned in regards to place matters. And, and it really is important on how we build our community and if our children aren't just going to a round, rounded school but coming home to a well-rounded neighborhood. So I hope with all of this, um, we'll look at those, those more endemic, those things that we really can change as a community with our neighborhoods being more inclusive. I think the latest that I read in some sociology stuff is the more inclusive cities have the most upward mobility across the population. So um, I think those are some things we can improve ourselves to help um, hopefully what would you say, positively impact the homeless population or negatively? Because I kind of want it to negatively. I want it, yeah, I'm not sure I how would I would say. I would say positively <laughs> positive impact decrease the homeless the, yeah. problem or yeah, issue. Or yeah, so I, I hope that we'll take that further as a um, council as well this year. Well, just so you know, the, the Bellingham that I grew up in was a very upwardly mobile community because it was completely integrated. And that's what I'd like to continue to see. So I appreciate that. Council members, anything further? Okay, the original motion is to endorse the mayor's request to Governor Jay Inslee to declare a state of emergency on homelessness. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay, seeing none. This passes unanimously. Thank you so much, Mayor Linville. Well, thank you very much, and I will take some creative license to add in some of the other things that we had talked about, so. Next item is approval of minutes. We have committee meeting minutes from December 14th. Who approval? Second. second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded to approve the committee meeting minutes for December 14th. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Motion passes 6-0 with Pinky Vargas excused. Next set is the special committee, committee meeting minutes for January 4th. Who approval? Second. It's been moved and seconded to improve, approve the special committee meeting minutes for January 4th. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, the, all those opposed say nay. Seeing none, this passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, older new business. The Hawks won yesterday. <laughs> Go Hawks. Council Member Hamill. <laughs> so, um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to get packets um, a little bit earlier than the timeline that we're currently on. So the, the uh, <laughs> I know it's a touchy subject apparently, but um, <clears throat> so what, just so the public understands the process here, so we get an online version of this typically on, a, on the Wednesday before the Monday, the following Monday meeting, and then we get this hard copy the Thursday, so the next day um, to go over. And some of us like to write in the packet and, and not not use it online and some of us it's kind of a mix um, my point being though is that it, it leaves us very little time then to especially to go through a thick packet and then if we have questions for department heads or staff or the mayor's office it, it provides us a very limited amount of time uh, three days or two days to make those phone calls and if we have to set up meetings with those uh, staff members it just provides a very truncated amount of time before that Monday meeting 
So what I'm, I'm asking if it's possible to have a, an extended period of time to, uh, for council members to be able to review their packet uh, so they, they are then allowed time to um, have those meetings, ask those questions, have those follow-up conversations uh, in preparation so that when Monday comes that we're very prepared. Not that we're not, but it just it's, it makes it a little bit uh, easier uh, to be prepared for the meeting. And I'll let, I'll let Brian talk about that. One of the things I guess I just mentioned is you're not, I mean, the questions that you'd like to ask staff might be informative to ask staff for the public to hear. So it, you're not necessarily limited to having to do something. I mean, we can, we can slow down the, the legislative process um, so that we can do that, but I think there might be some technicalities about putting, the, putting it out earlier because we're scrambling to get all the attachments and everything done by Wednesday so it can go to the printers. So, Brian, you want to? Brent Hunter's okay. mayor's office. It's a good question, um, and I'll actually ask Marie to chime in if she would like, because uh, the, the process for us is we meet every Tuesday to discuss the packet, um, and then on those weeks when there's a following Monday, we do our level best to get our uh, agenda bills and attachments and, and such to Marie by uh, 10 a.m., and we're normally successful at that, generally speaking. Um, <laughs> And so really, you know, the, the advantage for us is to have that Monday uh, as an extra day. And I suppose, I, I guess before we making decisions, I'd wanna, I think, really huddle with the mayor and the department head team and see what kind of efficiencies or improvements we could make to, really, I think you're talking about a, a day's improvement would be uh, about the most I think we could make reasonably. And I'm, I'm sort of, trying to be really cautious and in, in even committing to that because it uh, it is a challenge um, you know in this process to have everything you know by even uh, end of day Tuesday which is typically our goal even though we have until Wednesday morning and I want to be clear I'm not making a motion at this point that we take any legislative action but I'm, I'm asking and, and this is very informative if, if that's even possible and and I do want to clarify a point too it's not just um, email, having emails back and forth or phone calls or setting up me meetings. Sometimes these packets are hundreds of pages long, so it takes a while to get through them. So oftentimes what I find myself doing is doing a lot of follow-up reading or making or, or following up on a reference that was made in the packet or looking for history regarding a particular issue. So it's, it's the research time as well. And so I just, that is, that is a factor in um, being able to be a prepared council, fully prepared council for, for the Monday. Well, I have some new business, but I, before that, I actually want to respond to the issue you bring up. The issue Dan brings up is, is really significant. Um, but we've had a past practice that I, I think I'd like to remind us of, in particular, uh, remind the staff of. When there's a particularly large document um, for the committees that I've overseen, I've asked for it to be distributed, say, three weeks or a month early. So, like the economic development chapter, significant document, ask staff to have that available two weeks before the meeting where it was actually scheduled. Or if we do the parks and rec plan, a larger document. So I would think that some of those larger documents that are seen coming months away, those would be ones that we could request as a courtesy that those larger documents are distributed a week or two before they're actually put on the agenda. It'd still be in your pack, you still have to read it, but for that would, when the, when the packet gets large, some of that might be spread out. So rather than advancing the entire packet, make sure that larger issues are advanced as a pullout. That could, that could help alleviate the problem. And we've done similar things in the past. One of the things that I just wanted to offer too is um, something that I've thought about where you wouldn't even need a packet. I would just love to know what some of the hot topics are that are coming up in our government. Because then if I was interested or wanted more information, I could attend a planning commission meeting or I could reach out to some community members to see how they're feeling. So I just wonder if that would be a more simpler workaround to a lot of the issues that we deal with. Well, Member, just to um, help you feel a little bit better, Dan, way back when, when I first got elected, we, got our, we didn't get our packets until Friday afternoon. And they were three or 400 pages long, and it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you had to be ready for Monday. Uh, uh, this has been brought up before. Stan brought it up a few times. But I agree with uh, Roxanne. If there's a way for some of the big ticket items that are coming down, that we get that a little bit more ahead of time. 
where we don't seem to have the public hearings that we used to have with the hearing examiner now, but it always has been a frustration. We didn't get the packet uh, to the clerk until Thursday and they were printed Thursday afternoon and we got them Friday afternoon, so things have gotten a little bit better, but it's still, I understand what you're saying. The public has always uh, wanted us to have information earlier, but with if we stagger our meetings where we don't have two in a row, we used to meet every single Monday back then. So if we have that lag time, maybe things could be put off. So it, th there might be ways to look at it other than what we're doing now. But Councilmember Hamill. To be clear, I don't want to go back to that. No, schedule. no, I know that. I understand. <laughs> that. Uh, but, I, but I do support uh, Council Members uh, Murphy and Lilliquist, and that maybe maybe that's a viable workaround solution where it's not the entire packet, but there is kind of an alert or a heads up slightly earlier in the process so then we at least we can kind of see around the corner as to what types of issues that we need to do more research on and, and have those conversations. I'll just say that it's really funny when community members start activating to us and it's an issue that we have no knowledge of because we have not attended the meeting that they went through. So maybe some iterative steps like that could help. Councilmember Barker. There, as a resource, um, we were given from the planning department uh, agenda for the year, and it, and then I think you guys even made some changes and it was reposted. So I'm not sure if Public Works has that, but it's always been really helpful for the community, and it, it shows on there. I don't know if you're aware of the resource, but it'll say in the fall, spring, these are things that we're coming up to. Um, so. One of the things that we do, since we, we, we were trying to get ourselves prepared earlier, so the week before the council meetings, we'd be ready to go. So that's why we meet every Tuesday, even though you know a, the alternate Tuesdays, we're not having a meeting on Monday. So there might be some way to get the information, because we know two, two Tuesdays ahead of time, big issues that might be coming up on the agenda. But I'd also go back to um, looking at how we work through the council meetings and the information because the most important thing is that you have the time you need mm -hmm. to ask the questions you need to do to ask in order to make the decisions that you need to make and there's no magic formula in giving you a packet on Thursday and having you have Monday where you have to make a decision. So I think on bigger issues, maybe there's a different way to do that. And I know that um, Rick has done that a little bit in coming to meetings ahead of time and telling you what's coming and then coming back two, two meetings late or two weeks later so you actually have time to think about it. We'll, we'll talk about it at department head meeting on Thursday. Don't go a month ahead of time because I'll forget it by then. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll give you a special reminder, okay, Jim. Thanks. Okay, great. Councilmember Lilliquist? Under, well, sort of old business. This has to do with a Belling, establishing a Bellingham Salary Commission. Many jurisdictions have an automatic procedure set up where a citizen body reviews the salaries for elected officials because we cannot and do not review our own salaries. Whatcom County has one. Bellingham does not. Under at a retreat, it was brought up that we should establish a regular mechanism away from our decision-making a, a political body. We had our, our policy analyst, Mr. Gardner, look into the state law. It's really pretty straightforward, and the city attorneys looked at it. Um, I'd like to ask that we go the next step forward and ask uh, legal staff to drop that ordinance to establish a, a regular salary commission. There were a few unanswered questions, like how many people on the body, how often should it come up, review every year, or every four years, or whatever and uh, whether it should review all or some offices. Um, I have personal recommendations on that, but more importantly, I'd, I'd like to move that we as a um, council request that an ordinance be drawn up so that there can be some regular review mechanism like other communities. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded to draft an ordinance for a salary review commission for the council. Is there any further discussion? Well, can I uh, hear from uh, Mr. Rufato, who has been looking into this issue? Yeah, Peter Rufato, City Attorney's Office. The um, that sounds good. The I would want to go through the unanswered questions. You might see an ordinance, I guess, that has uh, some blanks, some placeholders um, on the first go around. As long as it's understood that that'll be the the sure. case, because I think there are some policy questions about what it will look like. Anything else from council? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Uh, this passes 6-0 with Pinky Vargas absent.
Councilmember Warneman. Yes, I just want to remind people that next Monday at noon in the uh, City Hall Rotunda, we'll, we will be having Martin Luther King's celebration. It will be from noon to 1 o'clock. The Coulson Chorus will be performing. We'll have some really good speakers. Come on out and join us. Yeah, I forgot there was one other uh, kind of old business. This has to do with um, looking at our city ordinances on waste disposal dealing with pharmaceuticals. Um, many communities, well, every, uh, people who look into it realize that one of the most toxic forms of waste we put into our waste stream is actually medicines, which often go straight through the sewage treatment plant and they go out into the waters. It's, it's not very good. And a lot of people now understand that flushing is not the way to take care of pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, again, our policy analyst did some work on this. There are some changes we can make, as his, his memo makes clear. We can adopt clear city regulations which prohibit the disposal of certain classes of pharmaceuticals down the toilet. Um, and the goal would not be to go out and find out who's flushing, but really to provide the basis for the education programs. There are collection sites at, at many pharmaceuticals. I think Hoagland Pharmaceuticals, for one, has stepped up for years serving as a community resource. Um, I'm asking the rest of the council if we would support going the next step on that pharmaceutical uh, disposal ordinance and maybe uh, increasing uh, our rules on that and looking at ways that we can educate the public on safe things to do with old medicines. Councilman Borneman. I would prefer since it's been quite a while since this, that issue came up that we put it on one of the committees just mm -hmm. to have a, uh, t to discuss it before we okay. direct an ordinance Good again, idea. you know, because I know public staff public? had looked into some things as well and so there, you know, if we could put it on uh, one of the committees, Great I don't idea. know if it would be public works or, yes, yeah, probably public works committee or something, we could have to have it on there. Should we make a motion? Well, I, would, I would move that we uh, refer the uh, issue to come back to the Public Works Committee at the earliest convenience for the staff. Second. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded to bring pharmaceutical disposal to the Public Works and Public Safety Committee. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 This opposed, seeing none, this passes unanimously. Mayor Linville. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll be happy to bring back, like, our current rules and that type of thing. And uh, if the council wants to develop a, any kind of legislation ordinance, then we'd be happy to work with Mark. And But I, I really appreciate if our staff is the one that actually writes right. the words. Yeah. Um, and I, just a little bit of a reminder, because um, I really appreciate Mark doing the research and that part of it, but I really think that because of the integration into all the city ordinances, mm -hmm. it would be best if the staff actually writes something if you cho choose to do that. Thank you. Great. Any other older new business? Just want to do a quick reminder. We've had um, more break-ins on in Birchwood and Columbia, and I just we're having less people walking and riding your bikes. And so, with my mommy hat on as a council member, I just ask that um, more people get out in their neighborhood and walk around, make sure they're locking their doors as well as leaving their lights on. And when you see somebody on the street you don't recognize, you can say hi. You might meet a new neighbor, but you also might deter a criminal. So, um, you know, please please get out there. Okay. Anything further? Okay, this, if there's nothing further, end of committee.